in Revelation 3. <clears throat> in looking at the seven churches of Asia, we've come to, come to the church at Philadelphia. It is possible <clears throat> for there to be a small church in a small town that has a huge work. Now, Philadelphia was not necessarily a small town per se. They were a thriving community at the time of the letters to the seven churches. But nonetheless, the church there seems to be little. But they were doing a big, good job. There's no criticism given of the church that meets at Philadelphia in Revelation 3, 7 through 13. Instead, everything that is said is an, a, <clears throat> a commendation. There is a, <clears throat> a warning given in terms of holding fast what they have, but everything that is said to them concerning their activity and efforts up to the point wherein the letter is received by them is a commendation. It's been said that if you want a work done well, select a busy man because those that aren't busy have no time. It's the busy people that, that tend to be able to make the most of their time. The church at Philadelphia was busy. They, they had a huge work in front of them, but they were doing it. It's sad to say that so often it's the case that there are, there are small congregations that, that really are working and then some larger ones that, that are doing far less. With Philadelphia, they were little, but they packed a punch. As we study these churches, we want to remember, and when we discuss the seven churches of Asia, we're talking about... Uh, the, these letters in Revelation, uh, a book that in and of itself is highly figurative, highly symbolic. But as we investigate these letters to the churches, it's nonetheless the case that the application, the practical application of the principles given still resonates today. Let's go ahead and move forward and start looking first at the city. Philadelphia was a city of numerous names first and foremost. Twice they had tried to rename the city for Bacchus or Dionysus, the, uh, the most recognized god in the area, if you will, the, uh, the god of wine. This was a city where grapes were prominent. Thus, you might uh, guess that they would have a certain affinity for the, the idol connected with the production of grapes and the vineyard. The name Philadelphia... We understand that to mean brotherly love. And it's actually a reference to the affection that the king who established the city held for his brother who preceded him on the throne. King Attalus II reigned from 159 to 138 B.C. And his older brother Eumenes had reigned prior to him. And despite uh, Roman influence, he still named the city for his affection for his brother. Now some tried to name the city Decapolis because it was one of ten cities of that plain there in uh, the region. Some tried to call it Neo Caesarea. In fact, some coins still exist that have Neo Caesarea on the coinage. Tiberius Caesar tried to name it this after an earthquake in AD 70 destroyed and flat out destroyed the city of Philadelphia. And with funds from the Roman coffers, the city was rebuilt. And so Tiberius tried to name it New Caesarea, but the name Philadelphia just stuck. Vespasian, the one who initially encircled Jerusalem, AD 68-ish, whose son Titus sacked Jerusalem, A.D. 70. Vespasian was emperor at the time. Vespasian tried to name the city of Philadelphia Flavia, because Flavia Vespasian, uh, yet that didn't stick. Now some gave it a nickname. Uh, for instance, the, the Windy City would be Chicago, right? The, uh, the Crescent City, New Orleans. The Big Apple, New York. Some tried to call Philadelphia Little Athens. The reason being because of the number of idols and the number of public buildings that were there. Yet that name really didn't stick for anything other than a nickname. It's been called the city of many earthquakes because of those seven churches of Asia. This was the city that was closest to the fault line that so often shook their lives. The modern name is Ala Shahir. It means multicolored city or red city. It receives that name from the volcanic uh, cliffs and the soil around them that 
uh, stand behind the city even today. So we're talking about a city of multiple names, but all those names failed to take. Philadelphia still stood as its name until uh, over a thousand years later when Ottoman influence uh, renamed it Alice Sahir. Yet so many still refer to it as Philadelphia, and we know why. It's a city of many names, a city of uh, numerous blessings. It was located 105 miles inland from Smyrna along the Cogamus River. Thus, river travel would bring uh, trade uh, past Philadelphia. 25 to 30 miles southeast of Sardis, and it was on the main east to west trade route, thus making it a major trade center. The volcanic cliffs that stood behind the city, the Turks called Devit or Inkwell because of the, the rich color of the soil. And this volcanic soil and uh, the results of it caused the land to be quite fertile for grapes. There are also spas from uh, uh, thermal springs in the area. As the city grew, its power and importance grew, uh, especially as those cities along the, the coast, some 100 miles away, diminished and dwindled in their influence. In fact, Philadelphia's influence really outlasted uh, the continuity of even the city of Rome because the western portion of the Roman Empire would fall in the 5th century B.C. Philadelphia was in what was known as the eastern portion and that city would thrive under the Byzantine uh, era, the, the eastern section of the Roman Empire that still stood in a sense. Philadelphia would continue to thrive. Of all of the cities mentioned in the, uh, pertaining to the seven churches of Asia, Philadelphia was the city in and of itself uh, that seemed to last the longest and that had at least a semblance of Christian influence that re reverberated throughout the centuries. When it came to religions, it was a city of numerous religions as well. There was a synagogue of the Jews there, which will be mentioned by Christ even in this letter, Revelation 3, beginning in verse 7. There were the different idolatrous temples. There was the temple to Bacchus, Dionysus. And this was a, a temple ward. This was a city that had a, a, a site of emperor worship. So their worship there included the Jewish worship of Jehovah, which was, by the way, expired. It included idolatrous worship, particularly Bacchus, Dionysus, and even the worship of the emperor. So we're talking about a city of numerous names, numerous blessings, numerous religions. Now moving forward, let's look at Christ. Revelation 3, beginning in verse 7, Unto the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, he that shutteth and no man openeth. Four major descriptions given. Well, we want to highlight three ideas from these descriptions. First, Jesus speaks with sanctity. These things says the one that is holy. Now this indicates an absolute separation from that which is impure, from that which is evil. He's the one that is uh, the high priest that became us who is holy and undefiled, Hebrews 7.26. He's the one that was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. He's holy. And by the way, he expects his people to be like that as well. Remember 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. It's written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. These things says the one that's holy. Holiness was not necessarily a characteristic or trait or quality that was highly esteemed among all the residents of Philadelphia. Remember, the chief god of the area was Bacchus or Dionysus. And while the Latins would say in vino veritas, in wine is truth, the fact of the matter is in wine is looseness. In wine is profligacy. In wine is lack of inhibitions. In wine is immorality. And when you have a city that centers its uh, identity on their production of wine, you can bet there are going to be intoxicated gatherings and the, immor the further immorality that will go along with them. Yet Jesus declares himself to be the one that's holy, the one that's pure. 
Moving forward, not only does he declare his sanctity, he declares his integrity. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. Alethanos is the Greek word translated true. The, the word itself is only used 27 times in the New Testament. 22 of those come from the inspired pen of the Apostle John. The idea is absolute trustworthiness, dependability. This description of himself rebuts what the Jews in the city would claim about Jesus. It ought to be noted that when we get to verse 9, he's going to say, I'm going to make those that are of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. He's used that sort of language when he wrote to the other church that received only commendation, the church at Smyrna back in Revelation 2. That congregation also had to face these Jews that claimed to be the followers of God, but they were the synagogue of Satan. The point to make here is this. As Jesus identifies himself as true, emphasizing his integrity and dependability, he is giving a description of himself that says, you can count on me. The Jews in the area would say, you can't trust Jesus. He's a phony. He's a fake. He's a fraud. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. John 14, 6. He's the one that is indeed true. He's the one that can honestly say, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, Hebrews 13, 5. He is the one that is dependable, reliable. He's the one that, upon whom we can count. We can depend. The question is, can he depend on us? Philadelphia was a city... <clears throat> Please forgive the uh, lead statement there. Uh, it, Christ describes himself as using sanctity, integrity, and he describes himself regarding his authority. He says, I have the key of David. Now this is a reference to Isaiah 22. By the way, you work your way through the book of Revelation. You'll find numerous references, particularly to the inspired, prophetic, and apocalyptic-oriented writings of Isaiah, Ezekiel, some references to Jeremiah, but more so Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah. Here, the reference to Isaiah refers to what was said about one named Eliakim who would serve as a steward, who would have the key of David, have authority to shut and none would open, to, to open and none could shut, Isaiah 22, 22. Jesus takes a phrase that was used of a servant in Isaiah 22, and here he applies it to himself as the sovereign. I have the key of David, and Jesus would have it permanently. He shuts and no man opens. He opens and no man shuts. Authority, legal right, absolute power. God had promised David, 2 Samuel 7, beginning in verse 12, that he would raise up his seed after him. He would establish his kingdom forever, his throne forever, his house forever. Here's that descendant of David. Here's the one that Peter would declare in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost to be the one of whom David foresaw when he said, Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He's the one that God raised up to sit on David's throne, Acts 2, 34 and following. Jesus declares himself at this point to be the one who is holy, unlike those Jews that claim to be holy. The one who has integrity, contrary to the statement of those Jews in Philadelphia that questioned his integrity. And the one that held the key of David, much to the chagrin of those Jews who refused to follow after the one that was the true descendant of David. What Jesus has to say to the church at Philadelphia very much centers around the primary form of uh, opposition that they would face, and that would be from the Jews in the area. So, having looked at the city, having looked at Christ, let's take a look at the church. Picking up in verse 8, Jesus says, I know thy works. He said that to every congregation. I know thy works, your ergon. I, I know your behavior, your conduct. I know how you act. I know Edo, I, I see with the mind's eye. I see, I perceive, I know, I understand how you act. And I've set before you an open door. It's wide open, just go through it. I've set before you an open door, and by the way, no man can shut it. 
He just told them in the previous verse, I am he that has the key of David, and when I open a door, nobody's closing it. I put an open door in front of you. And the only thing preventing you from going through this door of opportunity will be your own feet. Because the door is not going to slam. Now the church at Philadelphia was one of which Jesus gave great commendation. And he puts before them an open door because they will take it. We have to wonder, when he says, I've put an open door in front of you, you think they might have been familiar with doors being slammed in their faces, so to speak? You think they may have been familiar with those that would slam the door at a door knocking? Or maybe they're familiar with those that would slam the door of the synagogue and cast them out of it? Whatever the circumstances with which their recent memories were familiar, no matter what closed doors they had had to face in the society around them, Jesus assures them, I've set before you an open door. Nobody can shut it. Why? Why had Jesus set before them an open door? It's worth noting this open door idea also pertains to the very foundation of the city of uh, Philadelphia. The city was founded as uh, an open door for Hellenism going further eastward to introduce Greek culture into the regions of Phrygia, Bithynia, Mycenae, Lydia. Uh, it, was an open, it was seen as an open door of opportunity for Greek culture. And this idea of an open door is used throughout the New Testament. When Paul reported of what God had done through he and Barnabas on the first missionary journey, Acts 14, 27, he described it as an open door. You look at 1 Corinthians 16, 9, Paul said, I've got an open door, but there are many adversaries. 2 Corinthians 2, 12, he said, when I came to Troas, an open door was set in front of me. Time and again in the New Testament, the idea of an open door of opportunity is given. Jesus gives them an open door of opportunity and no one's going to shut it. No persecution, no opposition is going to be above or eclipse the chance to do the Lord's work. This open door of opportunity is given to the church that works. It's interesting, he says, I know thy works. He doesn't say, I know thy faith, although let there be no doubt. Their works are a result of their faith, because faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. But I know thy works. This was an active church. Now, yes, it is the case that we could say to a person today, you know, I know your work ethic, and that might not be a good thing. Jesus tells them, I know your work ethic, and it's approval. It is commendation. I know what kind of worker he is. I know what kind of worker this church is. I know thy works. One of the reasons they had an open door is because they were the kind that would take it. I know thy works. I put before you an open door because you have a little strength. A little strength. The indefinite article A does not actually appear in the, uh, uh, the Greek language. It could well be you have little strength. You, you're not particularly strong. You're not strong in number. You're not strong in influence. Maybe you're not strong in wealth. He just says little strength, little dunamis, little power. They were not what the culture around them would perceive as a dominant entity in the community. That's okay. Because who's despised the day of small things? The society around them looked at them as insignificant. And it looked at them as not a threat. That's just fine. Let the world around us think of us as insignificant while we labor to convert one soul after another, soul by soul, study by study. Jesus says you've got a little strength. But you've kept my word. <clears> Tereo, <throat> you've held to my word. You've grasped it. You've guarded it. You've not let it go. They uphold Jesus' name. They uphold Jesus' word. They're not going to abandon his identity. He that, uh, whosoever will confess me before men, him will I confess before my father, Matthew 10. These were doing exactly that. So they held to his name. They held to his word. 
Psalm 119, 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. They were listening to him. And by listening to Jesus, they're listening to the Father because Jesus said in Luke 10, 16, He that rejects me rejects him that sent me. These are holding to the word of Christ, thus the word of God. They, they see how sacred the word of God is. This is not a church that claims to love Jesus, but they never open the book. This is not a church that has a preacher that stands in front of them and says, hold up your Bibles, but, but you couldn't turn to, to a single page without having to try to peel the pages apart because of the rarity of the covers being separated. No, this is a congregation that holds to the Word. And not only the study of it, brethren, it is the case that we need to study the scriptures. But it's also the case the Hebrews writer said, when for the time you ought to be teachers, you need somebody to teach you again what would be the first principles of the oracles of God. That was a, a rebuke. We need to study the scriptures. But we want to stay away from the, the, uh, the, the mistake of spending so much time thinking we need to study, we need to study, that we're scheduling ourselves additional time for my own personal study and we're not trying to share the gospel with others. comes a point where we got to teach. There comes a point where we've got to take that open door of opportunity. There comes a point where it, it, it's time to graduate from this particular grade and move forward. Will there be continued learning even as we teach others? Absolutely. But there comes a point where we have to teach. The church at Philadelphia was a church that had upheld Jesus' name and upheld Jesus' word, and it upheld his word while they worked. And it was a church that used what little strength they had. Small number, low income, low class, don't know. But in God, physical strength can become, uh, physical weakness can become spiritual strength, being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Being little was not an excuse for laxity on their part. Brother Jim Waldron made the following comment. He said, here is a text for world evangelism. Christ as ruler of the church opens doors to faithful congregations, which allows them the opportunity to bear much fruit for His name's sake. Two reasons why some congregations don't see open doors. One, they've not put forth the effort for the Lord to give them any. Or two, the open doors are actually there, but they're not familiar enough with what they look like in order to recognize them. Whatever the case, the church at Philadelphia was told, you've got an open door. Implication? Take it. To whom would you rather bestow opportunity? The one that's active and trying or the one who, who sits and just takes failure for granted? We know how the Lord looks at it because He gave the parable of the talents, Matthew 25. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, He would say to the ones that invested the, uh, what was entrusted to them. But to the one that said, Lord, I went and hid your money because I was afraid I would fail. Thou wicked and slothful servant. So, the open door is given to the church that takes its talents, takes its uh, abilities, and puts them to use. A man went to a preacher, and he said, I want to win souls to Jesus. How do I do it? The preacher replied, what do you do for a living? He said, well, I, I, I'm an engine driver on a train. Okay. The man behind you that shovels coal, is he a Christian? Well, I don't know. Well, then go find out and start working on him first. How do I win souls to Christ? Start with the ones that you encounter as you're going into all the world. The church at Philadelphia had an open door. That open door is all about opportunities. We have the opportunities as well. Now, those things being said, let's go ahead and move forward. Take a look at the comfort that's given. I've set before you an open door, nobody can shut it, because you've kept my word, you've not denied my name, and I'm going to make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. I'm going to make them to come and worship before thy feet. 
Picking up at verse 9, the faithful in Philadelphia are going to be lifted above the liars in religion. They're facing infidel Jews. Paul would say he's not a Jew that is one outwardly, but the one that is one inwardly, Romans 2, beginning in verse 28. The, uh, the one whose commitment to God is truly there. Philippians 3, 3, Paul would say we are the circumcision. Uh, speaking to the church, we are the ones that belong to God. After he said beware of the concision, beware of the Jews that are still trying to bind the law of Moses. Galatians 6, 16, the Israel of God is the church. The infidel Jews at the time of John's writing were not God's people and neither are the infidel Jews today, much to the chagrins of those who are all up in a frenzy over the events taking place in Israel since October. Should we care about human life regardless of what their beliefs are? Absolutely. But we need to understand that the infidel Jews are not God's people so long as they deny the Christ. And once they deny the Christ, they're not infidels anymore. Abraham's physical seed is not necessarily his spiritual seed. Jesus made them face this fact in John 8 when he said, If you were, if you were Abraham's seed, you'd do the works of your father Abraham. <laughs> but they were doing the works of their father, the devil. What did he mean when he told the church at Philadelphia, I'm going to make them come and worship at your feet? Pay homage? Likely the idea is that at judgment, whether the specific judgment or ultimate judgment, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. Jesus assures His people that those that oppose and those that oppress the church are one day going to be those that take a knee before the Lord. We're already kneeling. They worship at thy feet. Not that the, the, the enemies are coming to worship the Christians, no. But they'll be on their knees as well. Victory for the Christ is victory for the church. The victory is already ours. The question is, will we hold to it? All will concede the gospel's truth, the church's divine source, the legitimacy of Christ, and the ones that hated the brethren. <laughs> the name of the city is Philadelphia. City of brotherly love. But the brethren there were hated. Why? Because they love Christ. So he encourages them to continue. The faithful in Philadelphia would be lifted above the liars in religion and the trials of the world. Verse 10, because you've kept the word of my patience, literally because you've kept what I've said about endurance and uh, carrying forward, because you've kept what I've said about bearing under, then I will keep you from the temptation, literally trial, perasmos. I'm going to keep you from the trial that's going to come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. When you read in the book of Revelation, the inhabitants of the earth or them that dwell upon the earth, you're reading about the earth dwellers. You're talking about those that are of a worldly mindset. There's going to be a trial that comes upon those that are secular, humanistic, worldly. We still see it happen at different points in, in modern times. The HIV virus could well be described as an ailment that when it began was one that was only afflicting those that were engaged in promiscuity and iniquity. Now the rampant uh, involvement in that sort of behavior led to the virus being uh, an infection that, that would even afflict the innocent over the course of time. But when it first appeared on the scene, it was impacting those that were engaged in iniquity. And it is the case that there are multiple occasions over the course of history when the, the affliction, whether it be a matter of health or a matter of uh, war or whatever the case may be, was coming upon the ungodly first and foremost. God tells the church at Philadelphia, I'm going to keep you from the trial that's going to come upon them, upon the worldly. Whatever it was He had in mind, there would be something, whether it be through the providence of God or by following God, they would avoid this behavior anyway, there would be something that would protect God's people from the hardship that was going to afflict those that were not God's people. 
the hour of temptation, some sort of trial. God's love is often seen in chastening. Romans 2, 4, If you despise the goodness of His forbearance and long suffering, know not the goodness of God leads you to repentance. God's patience leads to repentance, but there comes a time when God has to issue punishment. He wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants all to repent, 2 Peter 3, 9. But the question is, will they? There's going to be a chastening coming upon the people in the society around the brethren in Philadelphia. Move forward in the book of Revelation and you'll see examples of this sorts of, these sorts of chastenings and warnings, particularly with the seven seals or the seven trumpets. For now, we've taken a look at the city, the Christ, the church, the comfort. One more detail to investigate with what time we have left. We'll take a look at the charge. To those that endure, to those that overcome, to those that will heed what He has to say, Jesus makes a promise. He promises first and foremost a crown. Now He says, Behold, I come quickly. Whether this is in calamity or coming to aid and guard, whatever the case, don't take this as the second coming, but it's a, a sudden arrival in specific judgment on a society. Hold fast that which you have. Hold fast that little strength. Hold fast the word you're following. Hold fast my name. And for those that would do it, He promises a crown that can't be stolen. Yes, there's a danger of losing the crown if we let go of it. But it's no gain to the taker, it's only loss to the loser. The crown is as eternal as the faithfulness. See Revelation 2.10. He's not criticizing them, but He warns them not to take their grip for granted. He promises a crown that can't be stolen. He promises a pillar that can't be shaken. Remember, this was an area of earthquakes. I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Don't think pillar as in upholding, but think pillar as in permanent. This was a quake-prone city to the point that for a long, uh, a long period of time, people moved outside of the city and lived in tents just so that they would be away from any structures that might fall on them. Isn't it interesting that he says in verse 12, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he'll go out no more. You don't have to live outside of my city. You don't have to worry about uh, things shaking in my city. You live as a pillar. You're, permin uh, you're permanent there. The only thing left of the remaining ancient city are two pillars. You see one depicted before you. You've seen another in uh, images already shown. Isn't it interesting that in some of these letters to the churches, Jesus used vernacular that they might not have even understood the full import of it for centuries. But now all that's left of that ancient city are pillars, permanence. I'm going to give you a, a crown that can't be stolen, a pillar that can't be shaken. I'm going to give you a name that can't be surpassed. I'm going to give you the name of my God, the name of a city, New Jerusalem, that comes from God out of heaven. I'm going to give you my name. I'm going to write upon him my new name, new, kainos, new in quality. This was a city that had sought to be renamed multiple times, but it never stuck. But he promises those that belong to him, you'll have the name of my God, that's ownership. The name of the city of my God, that's citizenship. My new name, they'll be connected with sonship. They would have a promise of belonging to the Lord. To the church at Philadelphia... Small in power, quite possibly small in number, surrounded by all sorts of false religion, they had an open door. And no matter how grim that opportunity looked, Jesus could count on them to take it. Now there's a lesson for us to learn. Are we looking for doors of opportunity? Are we the city of brotherly love? Or, or do we have a hard time seeing them? Thank you for your time this evening.